Welcome to Podcasting and Platforms. Thanks so much. We are back with our second episode live here at Switchboard, and we are so excited to have everyone here. Great crowd enjoying Long's Donuts. And I'm even more excited to introduce my guests today. It is Dyke Michaels and Zach Roan of Harder Brunch, local podcast. Thanks for being here, boys. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. And last month, we talked a lot about why you should focus on local with the Boss Hog of Liberty. And today, we're going to talk about why podcasting is a great vehicle for building friendships to piggyback on last month's episode at the beginning. So if you didn't hear that, please go back. I'm not going to reiterate. Fortunately, a lot of the same faces were here last year, so I'm not going, or last month. So I'm not going to bore everyone with my monologue. I finished that episode. I was like, oh, we did an hour. Okay, that was too long. So we're not going to do that to you guys today. But Harder Brunch is like Boss Hog of Liberty. Your two podcasts, as I have gone out to find community support, to build in podcasting with other people, and to build a local movement of podcasters who are really invested in the idea of relationships and how podcasting can build relationships and serve a local community. Your two shows are the ones that I mention all the time. Boss Hog, because they do the relationship speech, but they really serve the broader local community of Newcastle. And you guys, because you serve a local niche, but you also have a ton of fun doing it, and you have summer camps, which we'll talk about. But let's get people acquainted with you. Dyke, how did the show start? And tell us a little bit about Harder Brunch. Sure. Yeah. I'm a stand up comedian and a failed restaurant. I went to culinary school. I thought I owned a food truck for a couple of years and I thought I was going to be a restaurant tour for the rest of my life. And I've been in the industry since I was like tw- in my early 20s or teens and basically just decided that I'd rather do anything else than open a restaurant. <laughs> I think most restaurateurs get there, don't they? Yeah, yeah. man. It, it's like a common theme that I hear from people that do that. It's rough. And I basically had a, a midlife crisis and decided what do I really want to do for the rest of my life, and that was stand-up comedy. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I work with Bob and Tom. You really <laughs> thought that would be a... Uh, never mind, I'm not going to crush your dreams. It's okay. <laughs> That's how bad the restaurant industry is. <laughs> so yeah, I had a couple different podcasts. I did like a nerd culture podcast for a while. Uh, I had a, a straight comedy podcast. And then I wanted something that I could do originally on my own. And I have zero technical ability. Okay. So I used the platform that started off with just recording on a cell phone on your table. Yeah. And I could just self-publish and everything was, it was made for dummies. And so I was like, this is great because I'm a dummy. And, Do you uh, even remember what the name of it was? Oh, it's it was Anchor. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. I started off on Anchor, and then I would just have a guest come over, and I would just cook one thing, and then we would have a conversation afterwards. And I think that's how I met Zach. Everyone that's a part of the show now is somebody that I met through those relationships that you're talking about. Yeah. And the show is what it is now because of those people. Zach is also the name of the producer of Boss Hog of Liberty. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah, who was here last month, also has no technical ability. He just liked that the show was good. He liked, he was a fan of the show, and then heard that it sounded poorly, Mm -hmm. (laughs) for lack of a better term, and volunteered to be their producer. Is how did you, Zach? Did you have a similar story to Zach at Boss Hog of Liberty? Yeah, I I came on as a guest originally. I used to have a a product company. I made mustards and ketchups. It was called Batch Number 2. Okay. And so I came on to talk about that with Dyke. I had known him a little bit, and what I felt was different was I had done a lot of, like, TV interviews, radio interviews, where you go in, you sit down, you do the thing, they ask you basically your resume questions, and then you go. And when I went there, I think we did, what was it, Bloody Marys Mm -hmm. and... We had a a big spread of Bloody Marys, and we sat, we talked, we imbibed, and got to know each other, and then we hit record, like an hour and a half later. And the whole thing was so different than what I had experienced. At the end of it, I knew that I wanted to be a part of it. That was when we still had a phone in the middle of the table, and I said, I don't know what I can do to help, but I see what you're doing here, and I would really like to be part of making it happen. 
So I started teaching myself how to produce. The only thing I know how to produce is podcasts. I have no other technical experience in that Children? realm. Yeah, I don't do a good job teaching them. So. Okay, but well, you produce them. So. They're there, though. Okay. But no, and yeah, there was something very different about the whole feel of it. And I started showing up every week, and we moved, we, we moved from that to proper microphones and a mixing board and everything. But no, just the kind of connection. I had never seen somebody take so much care in presenting something for their guests, like in just like an interview capacity. And yeah. I couldn't even get booked till July. When am I on? <laughs> August. Yeah. Yeah. It's and we started talking about it. And I was like, hey, can I come on? And that was like October. So you guys are, are doing something right. So tell me a little bit about what the setup is on a Sunday when you do the show. Take me through that day because. You guys are here. You're going to do this 30-minute, hopefully, podcast, and then you're going to leave. But that's not how Harder Brunch works. Oh, it's people that go to the gym. They always tell me, yeah, you do whatever, but you're going to get your gym time in. I have no idea. I've never been that guy. <laughs> that's, but that's how I go I, to the gym, and you're slimmer than me. <laughs> that's that's so how I feel about Harder Brunch is no matter what happens, like we're going to execute. I say we do a pop-up restaurant and a TV show every week. Yeah. And so Zach and I have a pretty much down to a science now. We talk early in the week about the guest. We try to curate some sort of menu that's either like in honor of them or something that we think that they would specifically really enjoy or something that's very seasonal. Yeah. And then uh, execute the food when they get there. Thad is our co-host who's not here today, and he's actually the the most charismatic of us. Mm -hmm. So he sits down with So he missed out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. You got a couple of duds up here. <laughs> They're doing their best, guys. But uh, you get... Evan, wake up. He sits there and talks to the guests and really does the front of the house. A lot yeah. of times we're doing the back of the house thing. And that'll take two hours-ish. Yeah, we usually start serving like around 12.30 and then... Our brunch lasts till about three thirty when we actually go do the podcast. So. It's like it's like multiple courses that come out, and it, you're. It's we'd like to mimic the hospitality of a sit down restaurant. That's and I think I heard a wow, because those of us who do podcasts are like, man, this is a lot of work. You guys do a whole meal, and a three hour. How many courses did you say? Four to five. Four to five. Yeah. Okay. We've had more. Why? <laughs> I, I think so from early on the brunch portion of it for me it's I've always struggled to find a like a way to monetize or, or make something out of that because yeah we've spent a lot of time coming up with this and it, at some point I had realized that hey maybe this is just the artistic thing I want to do we can make the show and push numbers on that uh, as I've gone I think I've realized that the reason why is there's something a lot deeper to sitting and breaking bread with somebody and even though it felt it, some weeks it feels like just throwing money down the drain. But what I've come to realize is that is actually, it's not even quantifiable what we're getting out of that. But yeah. that's building such strong connections with people on a face-to-face -face basis that I wouldn't ever consider cutting that, even considering the cost and time. Let me ask a transactional question, right? What do you two get out of that that it makes you put that much effort into it? For me, definitely it's an opportunity to cook. I feel like both of us are culinary school grads. Both of us have been in the, in the industry for our whole lives. So you get stuck in these ruts where you have to cook someone else's food or you have to cook the same thing over and over again. So it, this, it's a creative outlet is the simplest way of saying it. But it's also, so it's like a challenge. We can cook, you know, breakfast. We can cook eggs and stuff like that. But now let's, what are some of the wackier themes that we've done even recently we did we did one for our summer camp because we did a show to promote our summer camp and one of the jokes in there was our camp song which was involved saying wiener 17 times <laughs> so i did a uh, spread of 17 different style hot dogs which each of them had two or three elements and it was probably one of the most difficult like <laughs> things to put out because there were almost 50 60 elements going together on all these little it's hot hard dogs to make 17 once. wieners interesting yeah to be exactly we did, we did a play off of the menu, that movie about the horror movie about cooking or whatever. Yeah. And we brought a whole big mirror out and set it on fire at the <laughs> end of the brunch. But you're not doing that for content. That is just for your own enjoyment 
during brunch, right? So for me, I was a restaurant chef, and I transitioned from that to owning a small food business, mainly for the quality of life. I wanted to be able to see my kids that were on the way and, and have a little less stress in my life. And then I would say that restaurants killed my love of cooking, and I would say that Harder Brunch brought that back. The way that Dyke approaches hospitality has been one of the biggest inspirations. So many p places focus on the food. It's from this farm. It's organic, this, that, and the other. The amount of places that actually focus on the person that you're serving it to, I would say is functionally none. Yeah. And like the ability to do that, I didn't even realize that it was the medicine I needed to, you know, get my That's creativity great. back. Yeah, I find I have less time to create content to do my political show, to go deep into a subject, to understand fully something happening in the news and then articulate that after 30 hours of reading and research and watching documentaries and talking to people. And, you know, that to me is something that is not quantifiable. It's not, it, it's... It's good for your soul. So I, I identify with that. I think that's the great thing about podcasting is that you pick that thing you're nerdy about yeah. and you talk about it because your day job's your day job. And like you said, anything that you love, if you make a career out of it, it's going to take some of the shine off of it. But podcasting allows you really to dig into those things that you love with people that are also really nerdy about the same thing. Mm -hmm. I love that you guys, cooking is one of those things that people are nerdy about, but that's really hard to translate to a show, right? I guess you could do a cooking podcast like a, a New Age Julia Childs type deal on YouTube, but I think you guys have articulated here, hey, this thing that is really good for our soul that we're really nerdy about, we've managed to do a podcast around it without doing a podcast on that specific thing. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. There's times... Well, we, we will briefly touch on what we had, but it's more like the the focal point that brought everybody together, and then the podcast can just happen organically. But I think that those hospitality things, I, you, I think any of you guys can do those with your shows, with whatever you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be food. I think just find the thing that you're passionate about, and if you have a podcast about paper clips, just how do I set myself apart from all the other hundreds of thousands of paperclip podcasts and it's fine that those little hospitality things that you can do to leave to build those bridges with your guests i think what you guys have really tapped into is what we found at we are libertarians over those years where people were coming over to my apartment and we were hanging out for an hour talking about our circle of friends talking about the news talking about what we were going to talk about whatever it was a connection point every thursday night at 7 p.m and that made the show better because then all of a sudden you had a relationship and any interview show specifically is going to be way better when you know the person, right? It is harder to invite somebody over for a three hour meal and then do an hour podcast and you're there for four or five hours. That's a hard ask of some people, right? Oh, yeah. it, but, and it's a hard ask of yourselves uh, on a weekly basis. But the interview has to be so much better because you've had those conversations with your guests. Yeah, I think so. And sometimes you get some of the kind of superficial stuff out of the way yeah. during the meal. I also just think that it's important. To, I think there's something about as adults, we don't have, like we lose a lot of the kind of friendships and social interactions that you maybe had when you were in college or younger or whatever. My entire team is made up of people that came over and this never left. Yeah. And so having those relationships, but like having people come over and it's just like, it's a good time. It's a hang. If you have kids, it's like you get a day where you walk into a place and then you get a meal that's made, especially for you. And then we get to talk about you for an hour. And I, I think it's my favorite thing to talk. <laughs> about. Yeah. I think it catches people off guard and yeah. because if you're like me, whenever you agree to do something, even like coming here today, I was very excited about it. There's a part of me that when I wake up this morning, it's like, oh, I have you to go to leave my house. I got to get yeah. dressed and go do a thing. So I think that when you get to a place and then you have this incredible experience and then it's just, oh man, I'm so glad I came here. Yeah, that and that's really the, you've touched at the heart of why I'm trying to encourage people to do more in-person stuff. And I'm building a podcast studio block south of here at 801 Switchboard for that reason, to get back to that in-person yes. connection not just for me, but for other podcasters, because it's more fun than doing it on Zoom. And I think we've gotten to a place where everything feels like a task. 
I, I think we live in a culture that is very task oriented. Mm-hmm. There's another thing I got to check off, even with the people that we love. And so to have that cultural touch point that you built every week is so great for you and for your guests, even if they're coming in. Dyke, what happens when somebody comes in once? What, what I found is that people come in, they hang, and then they stick around. There's a lot of people here who <laughs> were We Are Libertarians guests five, six, seven years ago, and then just are still good friends because of those hangs, those conversations. What has been the after effect on your social circles on the podcast after, because you put hospitality before the content? Every everything comes back to me like tenfold. Yeah, the the hospitality that I put out and it was like, let's get Mother Teresa help people because it knew she would get into heaven. Kind of thing. Not according to Christopher Hitchens, but that's a whole <laughs> different episode. But I was like, I put this hospitality out, and I, at the end of the day, I just want to have a good time and a good episode. But it always seems to come back, and we we meet so many different creative people. Like I said, I had no technology background. But by doing the podcast, like that came back and the equipment came. And then all these creative people that we meet have the, all these different skill sets and all these deep banks of knowledge. And those just keep. And I would say almost every, I don't know, I would say 90% of the guests that we have on, they are now in what I call like in the heart of brunch business. Mm. Like they, like, Sometimes there's people that I feel are on the fence, and I'm like, we just need to get them over. If we, <laughs> if we just get them over, and they see what we do, and they have the time, they're going to be on our team forever. Yeah. That led to a summer camp, which is Noah, who is my coworker at Bob and Tom, great video guy, works with a lot of comedians. He told me you guys had a summer camp, and I went, nah. And then how it, it cost a fair bit to go for a lot of people, but then you had a lot of people show up. How did the idea of a summer camp come about, and what was that like? First of all, we've done a bunch of different events. We didn't start with the summer camp. Sure, okay. it, there, there was a ramp up to it. But again, it was just, I think, just drawing from the well of things that you enjoy or things that are important to you, and then finding a way to make those interesting and fun to others. So, like, I went to camp as a kid. I worked at a camp for, like, over a decade. We rented out my childhood summer camp. And then basically just did programming like a camp. So there was archery and canoes and, and pottery and uh, pottery, uh, crafts. And, and there uh, was no pottery. There was no pottery. You know? <laughs> I'm a liar. You <laughs> just watched Ghost last night. You got <laughs> but then we also had stand-up comedy and music, and it was sponsored by Upland, and everything's all inclusive. But it was like a, a festival where it's like you're there for the whole weekend. There's no day passes. Yeah. Like you're sleeping there either in a tent or in a cabin. Like you're eating in the mess hall and getting this real experience. And it's not for everybody. Like mm-hmm. even people that are like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Do you want to go? They're like, absolutely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> but the people that did show up had an amazing time. Yeah. And, and I feel like what we do with the podcast We did to those people now where they're in the heart of wrench business. Yeah, I think you're articulating something that I always try to get across to my clients is that, let me ask this because I think it may illustrate. I don't know the answer. I may look like a fool, but did the people that show up to your events and to your summer camp, are they more just people that you didn't know who listened to your podcast or are they those people who have been guests on the show and became a part of your network because of that intentionality? Uh, it was a mix. Okay. So we definitely have people, uh, pretty much all the people that I think helped us do it because it took a lot of volunteers. Sure. Or a lot of people that we've met through the podcast. We definitely have people that were listeners. But then also just a lot of people I think just resonated with adult summer camp. Yeah. And that, But... And then we get it because then we trick you into watching a live podcast when you're at summer camp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I promise donuts. That's why these people are here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, to me, the thing that I've noticed over time is that it's a blend. It's podcasting. Yeah, people come to it and approach it as content. And then I'm going to use that content to pull strangers into my net. But it is the network that you build along the way that is equally as important, if not more impactful. And by adding on a live event like this and actually getting in touch with people or doing the shows that you do at the White Rabbit or these summer camps 
and building relationships, it makes your network that much stronger for whatever your goal is. If it's for you, if it's hospitality and friendship, or if it's you have a leadership podcast and you're trying to find people, how can you get in front of those people and have real connections with them and get people together? Because if you are 30 and you move to a new town, how are you going to make friends? It's really hard. If you're not religious and you're not political, there's not systems set up for adult friendship. And I think podcasting, because of that interest sorting, can be a really powerful way to do that. So let's... and. You meet a lot of cool enemies too. Really? Yeah. You may, no. I, I've had I had some of those. Tell me about your favorite enemies. <laughs> no, I don't. I I feel like the most controversy that we got is incidental and not okay. typically aimed at us. It's like maybe someone didn't like a guest or someone that we. You're had not on. doing content there. You need to try harder. Start, <laughs> we try. You know, that that we no try. dishes podcast in Bloomington. They're fools and <laughs> ugly. And, say it. Oh, to start an active beef right now. <laughs> yeah, that's you got to gin up controversy. Wrestling and Trump. I think one thing I love about your story is it's very similar to mine and that you just started it and then you bolted the wings onto the plane as you were flying it like you were on a Boeing. And you just worked your way from a cell phone into microphones and you sat down and you go, what are these microphones here? Yeah, my first job was to look at the phone and tell him when 30 minutes hit. The same <laughs> phone that all of us could see. Yeah. <laughs> When you said that you recorded a podcast on a phone, I inside recoiled and was horrified. <laughs> but you know what I find? There are a lot of people that I run across doing the kind of the content side of what I do for podcasters that are doing phone podcasts, or they're just starting. And that's the best instead of what I do often now, which is way overthink getting to the thing, and I just have to push myself and go, look, I can't let the great be the enemy of the good, and let's just get going. Also, but, I think not that many people are listening to you at the beginning when you suck. And you, you've got this well, ego idea right. that, like, oh, God, everybody's going to see how horrible this is. No, nobody is. You, you could have told me that after the podcast, <laughs> like, not in front of everybody. <laughs> yeah, it, that's, it's like starting stand-up comedy. When you start yeah. at stand-up comedy, you have a bringer show. Yeah. You start at an open mic, and you have to bring friends and family, and nobody wants to show up. It's like... My dad once called me. He called me in like 2019. I had been podcasting since 2007 at that point. And he goes, finally, this is my first podcast. Dale Jr. is awesome. (laughs) 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 This is not getting around to the Chris Spangle show, are you? (laughs) But it's really hard to get your friends and family to to engage. I'm very fortunate. My mom's here and my wife and sisters-in-law and my family are cool. But it's... (laughs) My mom is in the background. But... Getting your initial circle sometimes can be difficult, but they're going to be your first people to that bringer show, and Um, you're going to fail in front of people that are going to love you regardless of whether or not that joke landed or, in podcast terms, the audio sounded bad. And then you're going to grow into it over time, and then you're going to start middling, and or you're going to start opening, then middling, then headlining after seven or eight years, right? It's a process, and you have to be a little forgiving and just move into doing a great job, and then along the way you'll collect people or you might find some sponsors that can help you pay for people who do services like me or some other folks who are here. And equipment. A lot of my early equipment was donated mm-hmm. by listeners. And have you guys found that? How did you come about your equipment? Just like dumpsters. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually had a, one of my original co-hosts. He had some disposable income. Okay. And he was embarrassed that I was inviting people over and interviewing with them on a cell phone. Okay, good. And so he was All like, right. oh, we're getting, a, we're getting a real setup here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, audio is not terribly expensive to get started, but what is the worst fiasco when it comes to equipment or recording that you guys have experienced? Oh, I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> I'll let Zach speak to this because he's a producer, but... For me, I'm the creative guy, or I'm. That's what I just I'm bringing heard you to say, the table. I'm an ideas man. I'm an ideas <laughs> man. So I want to do everything that I've seen on every podcast that I've ever watched, and there'll be things where I'm just like, I wanted a TV up on the wall that like somebody is sitting there on the laptop and bringing up like Jamie on Joe Rogan. I was like, I, I want that. That took two years to figure out. Okay, just getting a TV and bringing stuff up. Even getting cameras, we didn't. We've been doing podcasting for five years. We didn't re- video record anything till about two years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So all of those little things. It's every time you introduce a new element, it sends ripples out, and you're like, okay, yeah. how does this affect this, and how does this work? This. Mm-hmm. So sometimes my eagerness to 
implement something oversteps the actual, okay, how does that actually work? Right. Who's actually going to do that, Dyke? Because you're not going to. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, no, I would say we... We don't have as many on the technical side of problems. We have a pretty basic setup, and you do run into things where, like, the your computer will crash and it stops recording. You have to stop and start over. We've been fortunate that we really haven't lost any episodes. We've always been able to pull through. I would say that it's not always easy to find the answers that you're looking for if you have a specific issue. If you're trying to export your videos and then the, your computer starts crashing... And then you got to go Google why Adobe Premiere isn't working in this instance. And sometimes it takes a month of trying different things and actually figuring it out. But yeah, I, I think that would be maybe not having the, the, the support or whatever, because there aren't necessarily a lot of people who are podcasters out there. Like you see a lot of like radio people that went to school for radio, yeah. but I find that what I do is very specific. So even if we're talking to like music producers, like it's a completely different world and what they're thinking about, how they're running their settings. It's, uh, my buddy Ethan from WIBC is here and it is astounding how technologically illiterate a lot of our radio friends are. <laughs> like they don't know a microphone from a recorder. <laughs> it's unbelievable how help they're like babies. They're really all of them are like babies. Yeah, but I want to I think to illustrate that point, you guys show like I think people they start into podcasting and they go well, I got to get the right tech I got to get that it's the people mm -hmm. that that really matter and Kat I'm going to call you up here in just one second because I want you to come up and talk about them because I want a fan's perspective but Kat why don't you come up now actually let's have Kat from Hi, Kat everybody. is from the thing. yeah you're yeah. a little Kat is from the fake ass book club and Ooh, she is an awesome friend of both of our podcasts and really, hey, Kat, why don't you come back behind Zach here, just because that, that we're, we're going to get some feedback. Thank oh, you. That'd be you, great. Sir. Appreciate it, Garrett. The No Dishes podcast thought of that. Harder Brush <laughs> did, and I'm just saying. Hey, yeah. um, Still getting feedback. Yeah, so Kat, talk about Harder Brunch and how you got involved and what they do well and illustrate the points that I don't think I can effectively do the way that you might be able to. You were right to call me up, Chris. Actually, I know the Harder Brunch guys because of you. Oh, okay. You, you didn't know that, did you? No, I didn't. No. <laughs> so you were hosting an event downtown. It was a mixer. Yeah. And I just walked up. At first, I didn't believe that was Dyke's real name. Yeah, I thought he was how, doing a bit. You want to address that? Uh, yeah, explain yourself. Yeah. Is that your maiden name? <laughs> it's my married name. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's a family name. All right. Yeah. All right, the, I won't elaborate. Family of Dyke Builders. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. A lot so, of waterworks in your family. Yeah, yeah so we just started... Beavers. Um, <laughs> your master plan is working. People okay. are meeting each other, linking up, and they had me and Moni on the podcast, and... We showed up the first time. I think Moni was a little terrified because I was just being myself. I wasn't being <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, Moni, I, I get it. But I watched the show before and I knew I could be. I was right. like, these guys are stand-up comedians. They're not going to be like really sensitive or anything like that. But yeah, they gave us a bunch of food. Make sure when you show up, you're very hungry. Um, know that it might get a little blue. The humor, like you don't want to, don't bring your kids don't bring your kids. Yeah, get a babysitter. Prepare for a really good time. While we were there, me and Dyke figured out we went to high school together. We didn't even know that. <laughs> didn't you go to high school with Harry, too? Is that... I don't know. Apparently, I don't remember who I went to high school with. <laughs> I, 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 th I thought, where'd you go to high school? I went to Cardinal Ritter. Okay, that's a different person then. Yeah, but... We um, had a guest on the podcast once, and they went to school with Harry, and I was like, how did you not know each other? I knew everybody. And they're very good at curating sort of the guest list, too, because while yeah. we were there, we met Tenna and had her on the podcast, and it just ended up being this experience where it's like, if you're going to feed me, I'm going to keep coming back. So, yeah, yeah that's pretty much... I'm going to be there tomorrow. She's worked her way into almost being a co-host, right? Oh, yeah, she's third mic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's the thing, too, because I've been called in before when someone canceled like I said like yeah. everyone you if anyone's done podcasting you've had someone cancel on you and it's just like a whole thing so why have you worked your way what is it about the culture that they've built that made you want to get involved and keep coming back no one sexually harassed me <laughs> we laugh. That's, a pro, that's a pro tip that's a pro tip <laughs> thank you yes and you're a lot right of the, liber that a lot of the like libertarians here were like 
what does what? that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like weirdly enough, there's zero environments I've been in where that doesn't happen. And I was like, wow, this was actually a nice experience. Wow. I didn't even know that could happen. I'm like, yeah. Man, the bar is really low, guys. <laughs> <laughs> from- you can just walk straight over it. <laughs> yeah, and, there, and if you go, there is a dog. So if you're scared of dogs, but he's a friendly dog. But yeah. some people are scared of dogs no matter what. But just something to be aware of. Unless you're a mailman. If you're a mailman, I wouldn't. <laughs> he's not ha- Cody's not having it. So t- talk about the relationships that you see around Harder Brunch. The relationships I see, it's huge in the stand-up community. Mm. Like, I've actually found out about so many stand-up shows in the city from following them. Mm. And I love stand-up. So, to me, that's probably been, like, the biggest connection. But probably following, because I don't know. Did you guys know, you both know Dion? Yeah. Yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, and cause I've heard of him. You've heard of him? Yeah. <laughs> He's cool. But, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing. Second only to libertarians, comedians really need friends. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they can really only be friends with each other. It's, it's like you take libertarians and comedians out of their circles and it just doesn't work. Yeah, yeah right? it's not great. It's not great. But yeah, that's... Oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry, Chris. Plug them. Because I think oh. it's hard to plug yourself. I'll let you plug yourself, but give people the, the pitch to listen to their podcast. Yes, follow them. First, go to YouTube. Because like I said, the production is fantastic. And they've got a video element. Go to YouTube just... Right now, go to YouTube, follow them at Harder Brunch. Their IG, Harder Brunch. You guys are at. Do Harder you guys have Brunch. a graphic artist? Because your graphics are awesome. Yeah, yeah very consistent got a branding. Yeah, that's really good. Very consistent branding. And then what? Cake. How did we not talk about meat cake? I think that's like your. That's like the like one of your best events. Yeah, we have two tent pole events in the summer. It's summer camp. In the winter, it's the meat cake invitational, where <laughs> we invite some of the best chefs in the state to compete building these giant wedding cakes that are made out of meat. And then <laughs> you get a ticket and you get a sample, each of the meat cakes. Cooked or and then, raw? And then you... And it depends on how you want to do it. Yeah, right. There was some tartar. Yeah. <laughs> was some tartar. My dad's a golden retriever. I'll, I'll eat it. <laughs> but uh, it's grown from something that we started as a joke in our house between three, three of us to something that we had 10 chefs competing. <laughs> We did a half liter with a couple hundred people there. Indy Star came out and did a whole piece. <laughs> Why meat? Why meat cakes? Why not meat? I think the original <laughs> thing was we, I was arguing with a, a, a pastry chef, uh-huh. and I was like, I could make a cake if it was made out of meat better than you. And she was like, no, you couldn't. And she was right. She was like, oh. Turns out she was right. You don't go with sheep next time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's and it's a fun thing, and... I think the thing that gets me excited about doing events or the way I approach podcasting or whatever is I'm always trying to do something that I haven't seen before yeah, or something that's at least new and different enough that I'm excited about it. And I think the excitement trickles down. Yeah. So last, let's save that. Let's take any questions. Thank Can you so now? much for Kat. Can I go? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Does anybody have any questions for the Harder Brunch guys that you'd like to ask? Don't be shy. You guys, come on up. Yep. Ava, thanks so much. Please feel free to ask. Can I have a seat? Yeah. I was just going to ask, what was the most impressive meat cake you've seen? (laughs) I think ours that we made that did not win this year. uh, We made a meat dragon. uh, It it was a a charcuterie dragon. And we actually got dry ice, so it breathed smoke. Oh, my gosh. Um, We did not, somehow did not win. But, no, there was, there's uh, some... um, Amazing stuff. Literally, Chef Yusuf, who is one of the best baking and pastry people, he did a croquembouche thing with foie gras in it. Just some really creative stuff. The guy that won did a melted clock, and it was Salvador deli meat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually... <laughs> um, Standing up or laying down? He it had was... it on a tiered situation <laughs> so that it, it actually oh. drooped. Oh, my God. It, was a, yeah, it, it, it deserved to win. Yeah. <laughs> Kudos to you for designing a contest that you didn't win. Because I would have been like, you vote for me. I, put, I paid all the money for this. <laughs> Chris, I've been trying to win for the past four years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, you have any other, do you have another question? Uh, no, not that come to mind, but I might pop back up. All right. I have any. Thank you so much, Ava. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Anybody have one? All right. So, gentlemen... Final thoughts for our listeners, for our audience, advice to have a successful podcast. I would say the best parts about Harder Brunch 
were the things that I didn't know were going to come to fruition, but enjoyed doing. So like the cooking and all of that, for a long time, I tried to reconcile, how do we make this make sense? And it turned out that part of it made more sense than anything. So I know sometimes like I, I would do the things that you feel really passionate, that you feel good about doing after you do it. I think we all have the, the episodes where we're like, man, we killed it that time. And stop worrying as much about the numbers and how you're going to make this connect to that. And yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think if, especially if you're thinking about starting a podcast, maybe if you're not a hundred percent there yet, do something that you are just a hundred and ten percent passionate about. I think so much of podcasting is about consistency and about being in it for the long haul. So if it's something that you're just into or on the fence, unless you're maybe if you're really passionate about learning about, that's one thing. But just it's going to be something that you do on the days that you don't want to do anything. It's going to be something that you have to do all the time. So much of it for me is the fact that I'm passionate about food and comedy. So combining those two together are great for me. And then I think the other thing is, too, is just go out there and try to support other people's shows, too. That's a gr- Events like this is a great way to meet people. It's at, like Kat said, it's how I met Kat and Moni. I got no dishes coming on the show tomorrow that we're recording cool. and met them here. Do you want to say what you're making them? No, it's a surprise. Okay. All right. And then when's your next event? Shameless self-promotion. How can people find what you do and what's your next event? Yeah, we're at... Harder Brunch on all social media. We have this thing. We also have a, a YouTube clips channel. I, if you're not going to listen to the whole episode, or you just want to hear like a funny blurb, just subscribe to that YouTube clips channel. We upload five different clips every week, and they're usually pretty funny. But this is a peep show. We basically came into a pallet of peeps. <laughs> Don't ask us how. It's, I'm not going to reveal illegal. that. Uh, but Zach called me in the middle of August of last year and said, I got a pallet of peeps. I want to do an <laughs> Easter themed live show based around these peeps. And I said, Zach, it is August. <laughs> we still have a summer camp and meat cakes to do before this, but uh, it came around and we're very excited. We've done uh, a number of live podcasts last year. We started doing them at comedy festivals and then, We've started doing them at the White Rabbit, and they've become their own thing. It's a bit of a hybrid of our podcast and our Patreon, I think, Yeah, because you are performing to a live audience, but it's really fun. There's We have games. It's interactive. We're going to be doing a peep-eating contest. There's going to be a live stand-up from Brent Terhune, who's one of the biggest stand-ups in the state, and then there's also going to be like a burlesque peep show in the middle of it. I just pee pee eating contest. <laughs> yep. That's <laughs> Can we put you down as one of the contestants? I hate peeps. <laughs> and I'm I got diabetes, so no. <laughs> we can give you more. <laughs> okay. You should get sugar free. If you also if you want to come on the event bright, if you put promo code podcast, podcaster. We'll give you, podcaster, sorry. Five it's five dollars off for everybody. Five dollars off for everybody here today. Very cool. All right. Thanks, fellas. Everybody give them a round of applause, please. Thank you so much for joining us here on Podcasting and Platforms. If you want to learn a little bit more about my podcast consulting business, go to leadersandlegends.net. We're going to have the Podcasting and Platforms creator space up and running within the next month. So if you want to come and record at high-quality equipment in Fountain Square, be great. The next Podcasting and Platforms Live will be May 2nd. We're going to try a Thursday evening because trying to do anything on a weekend in April, May, and June is impossible. So we're going to try it on a Thursday night and see how that works. want to thank my lovely wife, Reagan. Please give her a round of applause. Not only did she up till 2 in the morning hot gluing moss to a 72-square-foot wall, she also makes these things run. And thank you to Lauren, her sister, and an awesome videographer. And to Switchboard and to everybody, to Jen Eads for helping greet everyone today and everybody else I'm forgetting to thank. But thanks so much for being here and we'll see you on May 2nd.